Thanks, Chris. There's two more things I'd like to share with you before we have our guest speaker come up. Um, one is, just want to remind you that the next breakfast meeting is on the 27th of April. So put that in your calendar, your phone, or wherever you need to put it so that you remember. Second thing is, um, men are like fine wine. They start out as grapes, but it's up to the women to stop the crap out of them until they turn into something acceptable to take to the dinner table. <laughs> With that, I'd like to, uh, like to introduce Steve Lato. Uh, he's been practicing lemon law and consumer protection for 23 plus years. He's handled cases for thousands of consumers. He wrote the Lemon Law Bible and taught at the University of Detroit Mercy School of Law for 10 years. He's a frequent le lecturer on consumer law and has been quoted by or appeared on countless media outlets such as the New York Times, the BBC, CNN, Good Morning America, WDIV, WJBK, and WXYZ. He's also written several book, several award-winning history books on topics as diverse as Italian Hall disaster, the wrongful conviction of Timothy Masters, and the Chrysler Turbine Car. Would you welcome Steve Lato? Preaching to the choir here because many of you are familiar with the Chrysler Turbine Car Program. There are probably a few of you who aren't as familiar with it as some of your compatriots might be, so forgive me if it sounds like I'm being a little bit elementary on some of this stuff, but I want to make sure everyone understands what a remarkable program Chrysler did with the Turbine Car Program. Chrysler built jet powered cars from 1953 until the 1980s. And many people are familiar with the Chrysler Turbine Car being the bronze colored car. I'll show you a picture of it in a moment. And people remember that as the Turbine Car. But actually the program was much larger, involved more people, and was very immense in scope. And so you have to go back to the days after World War II when jet engines were just being developed for the first time. Sam Williams, Dr. Williams, was a physicist who worked at uh, Chrysler. And he went to some of his bosses and said, you know something, I think we could put a jet engine in a car. <laughs> and back then, I guess if you brought an idea like that to your bosses at Chrysler, somebody might say, sure, why not? So a guy named George Huebner became the patron saint of the turbine car program at Chrysler. And he's the gentleman standing in the far right of this picture. This photograph is 1953 Highland Park as they lower the first jet engine or turbine engine into a car. Dr. Williams, for those of you who don't know, later went on to found Williams International, which is still running in Walled Lake, Michigan, where they make jet engines. Dr. Williams was blind, legally blind, and he is in the photograph. He's the man with his right hand on the driver's side fender of that car. Dr. Williams, um, among other things, would have uh, somebody read magazines into a tape recorder and listen to the tapes later so he could keep up on, for instance, the physics journals and so on. So imagine the fact that this guy is designing a jet engine, in essence, in his head, and then getting the information out that people worked with him to where they could finally scale down a jet engine. <clears throat> for those of you who are curious as to why you'd want to put a jet engine in a car, besides the fact it's just a really cool thing to do, Jet engines have fewer moving parts than piston engines. Piston engines do what we call reciprocate. That is, the pieces move back and forth, causing vibration. We were talking about Hemi engines earlier this morning over breakfast. Hemi engines vibrated quite a bit. And that makes a lot of noise and also makes them want to come apart over time. Turbine engines have central parts that spin. And because they spin, in some respects, they're more efficient. The other neat thing about turbine engines, and they didn't quite get to this till later, was the fact that they are multi-fuel. 
a piston engine car is very specific as the kind of octane gasoline you run in it. Turbine engines will often run on any liquid that burns, which is, you can imagine today, if you could pull up to a pump and say, you know, it's going to run the kerosene, or I'm going to run the vegetable oil today, might make a difference how much money you're spending on gasoline. Now, I understand gas prices have come down recently, so we aren't as worried about them as we were when they were $5 a gallon a little while back. But this is something that would make a difference over a long period of time. Um, also in this picture, I mentioned George Huebner on the far right um, and Sam Williams. But these guys are posing as they lower the first jet engine in. They got the thing running and they immediately take it outside and they hold a press conference where they demonstrate the car operating. They very quickly discovered that the jet powered cars or turbine cars were huge public relations bonanzas. People loved these cars. And I don't know if they spent any money promoting these cars, but I do know they got so much press coverage from about 1953 until even the, the early 80s that it must have been worth hundreds of millions of dollars of free advertising. So if you go back through uh, old archives, for instance, and look at old newspapers, you will see on the front page of the free press, the news, you know, Chrysler demonstrates new jet car, Chrysler demonstrates second jet car, and they were getting all this free publicity out of these cars. If you look very closely at the photograph, Dr. Williams is sitting in the back seat. I suspect George Huebner is driving, but we can't see. George Huebner is a gentleman who um, loved cameras. Cameras loved him. I've only found one photograph out of the hundreds I found of him where he's not wearing a suit and tie with a jacket. And it's an informal photograph that I think was posed. I was speaking a couple years ago over at Grand Rapids, and I encountered some of his children. And they came up to me after I'd spoken. And I'm always careful because you don't know who's in an audience. And I, I don't like to, I'm not making fun of George Huebner. George Huebner just loved the press. He was a PR guy. He was a promoter. And I, I was talking about how much this guy loved, you know, he's in every photograph. There's, there's a car and you see George Huebner leaning into the picture. And his, I think it was his daughter, or his daughter-in-law, you know, she's, no, that's how he was. And so, you know, he, that's, that's how he was. But his promotional spirit is one of the things that kept this program alive. You might know that Ford, for instance, had shoehorned a, a, a jet engine into a car at one point in time. General Motors built the Firebirds, which had jet engines in them. But you know, we don't hear about those cars because those programs were very, very short and nowhere near the scope of what Chrysler did. So Huebner was the guy who kept the program going. So what they would do is they'd build a jet engine, they'd get it running in the laboratory. Once they were convinced it was viable, they would then drop it into a car and uh, they had to solve all kinds of engineering problems. So for instance, as you can imagine, a jet engine on a jet is a very large thing. To get it small enough to fit underneath the hood of a car, and then to put the power through to a transmission and so on, they had to solve all these problems. And also the cost of developing a jet engine. If you look at the internal parts of a big Pratt & Whitney jet engine, each blade on the turbine fans are put in individually, they're individually made, they're individually balanced, it costs a fortune. The turbine engine that Chrysler developed had fan blades that were cast as a single unit. One disc, every single fan blade on it, one piece out of a casting. They, they figured out how to do that efficiently, cost effectively, and it was one of these things where it was a huge team of guys solving problems because they wanted to put a jet powered car on the road. Once they developed a new jet engine, they drop it into a different car. I'm not as good on the 50s Chrysler as I am on the 60s, so I can't tell you what some of these cars were. But I assure you, this car right here has a turbine engine in it. Not the least reason is, is that on the rear trunk lid, you'll see it says turbine. And that's one of the things they struggled with, was whether they should call these cars anything other than that. But they finally, just every single one just says turbine, turbine, turbine on it. But you'll notice that the gentleman behind the car is feeling the exhaust. And one of the interesting things, whenever you develop a new technology, introduce it to the press, people will often speculate, and then you hear rumors and stories, and many of them are true, and many of them are not true. So one of the rumors that still sticks around to this day, people will tell you that the turbine engine would melt asphalt. It'll melt the car behind it. It's dangerous to walk near. That tailpipe is putting out exhaust that is cooler than the exhaust of a contemporary car with a gasoline piston engine. And everywhere they went, they did that demonstration. Often you'll see George Huebner with his hand in the exhaust, often it's somebody else. 
they often would hire a model to walk up and adjust her stockings in front of them to show how. <laughs> well, I guess I'm not sure what they're showing there, but that was something that they did over and over again. And again, the cars were not cranking out dangerous exhaust. Uh, later on, I'm going to mention Jay Leno because Jay Leno owns one of the turbine cars and he's a, a big booster of alternative fuel vehicles. He has three turbine powered vehicles one is a Chrysler turbine car, one is a, uh, a vehicle that he custom built with a Honeywell, I think, helicopter <coughs> turbine in it, and then one is a jet powered motorcycle. And apparently, that does have a dangerous exhaust simply because the engine is here and the exhaust is right here and it doesn't have very far to go to cool off. But we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. So along the way, they drop the turbine engine into all kinds of things. And again, I, <laughs> I'm sure this car is beautiful to many people. Um, it's, not, it's not my favorite. But that has a turbine engine in it. And you'll notice it's a large car. The turbine cars that most of you have seen, the bronze cars we're going to talk about in a second, are smaller and sportier looking. But they did occasionally put turbine engines into big cars. I have no idea what this thing weighed, but it had to be a lot. And they put a turbine engine in it, and the turbine did just fine. Interestingly, if you put a turbine engine in a car and compare it to how a piston engine car performs, the turbine engines have interesting characteristics. They create a lot of torque, um, but it takes a while to spool up. So you often hear people complain about how long it took to get going, you stepped on the gas, that kind of thing. The throttle response was slow. Americans like to be launching from the stoplight. Light turns green, you floor it. Um, so there are some issues they had to work out, but every engine they came up with is a little more efficient, a little bit more um, powerful, and so on. Again, here's another one. It says turbine special on the side, so we know it's a turbine-powered car. And uh, the man on the left is George Huebner, uh, and he's showing the car to somebody for a press opportunity. I've seen nice 8 by 10 glossies of this. And every time they came out with a new car, they'd hold a press conference and issue the press releases and the photographs. And like I said, they got tons and tons of publicity. Somewhere along the line, George Huebner came up with the idea of driving one cross country to show how dependable the cars were. And that's the interesting thing. And, and you know, modern cars require less maintenance, I think, than cars did in the 50s and 60s. And so there was a time when people said, well, if we buy one of these cars and it's got a turbine engine in it, are we going to encounter problems that no one can solve? I mean, if we pull into a gas station and our turbine engine's making a racket, uh, is the guy at the gas station, back when you could find a guy at a gas station and pop the hood of your car and work on it, is he going to be able to pop the hood and work on the turbine engine? So the point here was, well, you don't need to get service for it because it's dependable. And they actually did this cross-country trip in this car from New York to Los Angeles. And then later, that was such a success, later on they did it a second time. And when I was writing the book about the project, I interviewed several people who were on these trips and they're talking about what it was like to go on a road trip with George Huebner. And he drove some of these miles off when the cameras were around. And there were other cars following with support crews, technicians, mechanics, engineers. And these guys would be a caravan of cars led, you know, led by a turbine car driving cross country. And they'd often stop at all the major cities, hold a press conference, demonstrate the car, and then go on their way. It's you know traveling road show. So George Huebner then wrote an article that appeared in Popular Mechanics. That's another fun thing is if you look this program up and go back to that time frame, Popular Mechanics, Popular Science, Time Magazine, Life Magazine, every magazine and newspaper at that time would do stories on the jet-powered cars. And many people thought that this, this was just a done deal. These were coming. We're all going to drive a jet car someday. It's kind of like the, the, the flying cars we're all going to have also. Um, we, we never got to that point, but the, the optimism that this program created because Christ was clearly doing a lot with this, creating more cars, improving the cars, and so on. So this is the article, we drove a turbine car coast to coast, and it's George Huebner's uh, exciting tale about how they were driving along the New Jersey Turnpike and a cop pulled him over and said, I just want to look at the engine. So um, got a lot of publicity out of that. Now, this is a, a, I believe this is a Dart, or the Dart sister car, I always get those two confused. Uh, and this is, a, again, they had seven generations of turbine engines. So this is a third generation, I believe. And you'll notice that you pop, well, there's something in there, but it doesn't look like a typical engine from the time frame. A couple odd things to notice, uh, and one of them is those two big beer keg looking things in the front. 
Those are air cleaners. And if you picture or imagine a jet engine on an aircraft, it's got that big opening at the front with all the air coming in. And jet engines and turbine engines process a lot of air, tons of air. And not only do they use a lot of air, but it makes a lot of noise when the air comes in the front end and also when it goes out the back end. And so they were always trying to solve these problems. And one problem is if you're going to make a vehicle for consumer use, it can't be that different from a typical car. You know, it's got to have a key and a steering wheel and, you know, gas pedal and brakes and so on. So one of the things that they were dealing with was what this thing sounded like. So to quiet the car down, they figured out that they put two air intakes, like they had to face them at each other. They actually got the sound to, in essence, cancel out. So the car wasn't that loud at the front end. Interestingly enough, they did marketing research and they discovered that people still wanted the car, if they were going to buy one, to sound like a jet. People wouldn't want to buy a turbine-powered car and have it sound like a V8. Because if you spend that kind of money, you want it to sound like a jet. So they actually, and there's, there's some debate about this, but I think it's true. There's some debate that some of the engineers actually sat down and said, how can we make the engine quieter but still sound like a jet engine? And one of the things that you associate with the sound of a jet engine, if you think about a, a, a plane taxiing around a tarmac, the noise you hear is actually a lot of gear noise, because there's a lot of gears inside the jet engine turning like auxiliary power units and so on. And there's a lot of gear noise coming out of this too, and, and there's, uh, like I said, some, some speculation that the gear noise is left in because they wanted it to sound like a jet engine. Um, the turbine engine, I purposely picked some different slides here because I know there's some cars that you, you know, we've all seen certain turbine cars out there, but they did in fact put a turbine engine into a truck. And this truck showed up at an auto show in Chicago in the early 1960s, and there's very few photographs of this. And I've spoken to some people, and I, there might be some people in this room who've got knowledge. We don't know where all these vehicles are today or what happened to them. Um, and unfortunately, with the various changes that have taken place at Chrysler in the last 30 years, you know, some of these collections have gone under different management and so on. But this truck is one, you don't find a lot of photographs of it, but it does have a turbine engine in it. And in fact, they drove that truck to the Chicago Auto Show, and I saw articles in the papers about, you know, how we drove a turbine-powered truck to the auto show. And you'll notice that there's actually a platform to get up and walk around and look down at the engine compartment and see the turbine. So after they had developed the turbine to the point where they thought it was viable, George Huebner came up with the idea and said, why don't we build a fleet of these cars and lend them to the public? And this is called the user program. They decided to find families around America who would use these cars as a big test experiment, but also public relations experiment. So they announced to the press, by the way, we're going to build a fleet of 50 cars, and we're going to lend them to the public. If you want to drive a turbine car for free for a couple months, write to us and let us know. We're going to pick names and, and, and lend these cars out. And they got about 20,000 requests from people across the country who said, I'd love to have a turbine car for free. So Chrysler contracted with Ghia in Italy. And Ghia, of course, did a lot of the body work and the smaller run and, and a lot of the show cars that Chrysler built. And had Ghia build a fleet of these cars. Um, this is often called the turbine car, but it's also called the bronze turbine car because this is the one most people are familiar with. They actually built 55 of these cars, and 54 of them are this color, turbine bronze. In fact, Chrysler revived this color a couple years ago and put it on some show cars and, and, and said we're bringing back turbine bronze just as a, a, a callback to the, the you know, days that we were putting turbine cars on the road. And all 54 of the cars had the same paint job, and then 50 of them <coughs> excuse me, had the same interior with a black vinyl top. Believe it or not, there's one that was white with a blue stripe. If you're ever really, really bored, go on the internet, look up a movie called The Lively Set. And the turbine car stars in that movie along with some other teen heartthrobs from the 60s whose names I've already forgotten. And um, IMDb referred to the film as a horrid piece of trash. <laughs> but there's about 15 minutes of footage of this white turbine car being driven around inexplicably out in the desert, um, but as a race car. And what's funny is in all the scenes that are shot from a distance, the guy driving the car was a Chrysler employee named George Stetcher. And when, when the film company approached Chrysler and said, we'd love to put one of your jet cars in our movie, 
Chrysler said, great, we'll do it, but the car can only be driven by our guy. So all the faraway shots are George Stetcher. All the close-up shots are guys sitting in the steering wheel doing this with a fake screen behind them. But that was the white turbine car, the blue stripe. 54 of them, turbine bronze. <coughs> But 45 or 46 these cars were lent to the public. They'd pick a family scattered across the country. They wound up picking 203 different families. And you got to keep the car for a few months. All you had to do was put fuel in it. It was insured by Chrysler, maintained by Chrysler. In fact, it's a gentleman named Bill Carey uh, who lives in this area. And he's actually the guy who's on the cover of my book, Eating a Donut, leaning against the trunk of the turbine car. He was given the job of keeping that fleet running. So he would often get a phone call in the middle of the night, and they'd say, yeah, we just got a phone call that the turbine car in Dallas just broke down. And he said he'd hop on a plane, fly to Dallas, show up at the dealership, and you know, it might be you know, something that was turbine-related or might not have been turbine-related. But they were told very, very specifically, no one works in these cars except for us, and it's always, almost always Bill Carey. Um, the 203 families that had the cars, the program lasted a couple years, they logged over a million miles in these cars. So as far as that goes, the, the program was a resounding success. People said they would love to have one of these cars if they could. And one of the neat things was that the car would run on any fuel, as I mentioned before, that's liquid and flammable. Some of the people who got the cars and user programs took advantage of that. So for instance, I, I interviewed a bunch of people who had the cars, and I've also read review, uh, the, uh, interviews of people who did. There were people, for instance, who used their home heating oil. So back then, they'd get a big tank of home heating oil. They'd literally pump that into their car and drive on it. Or guys would go to the gas station and say, I need to buy kerosene by the barrel. Buy barrels of kerosene, it had no road tax. And you know, back then, gas wasn't that expensive, but kerosene was cheaper. Um, so people loved the cars. The only complaint people had about them, of course, was the fact that if you stomped on the gas, it didn't accelerate quite as quickly as you'd want. But the one thing they all said, Overwhelmingly, every member of this group, 203 families was, everywhere that car went, it caused a sensation. It would stop traffic. If you tried to go shopping, you'd be swarmed at the shopping center. When you came out to your car, there'd be people standing around it. Chrysler, very smartly, did not put an outer hood release on this car. This is a very, it's a 1963 car, and it's got an under dash hood release, because they recognized that if they had an outer hood release, Everyone who saw them would walk up and pop the hood to look at the engine. And they didn't want people tampering with the cars. So uh, that's one of the interesting little things about that. Likewise, there's no, uh, the, the, the trunk release is hidden inside the car also for a similar reason. But the 203 people who had these cars, I read interviews, I've, I've spoken to them, said, for instance, that, th that they, towards the end of the time with the car, they got so tired of having people come by and knock on their door saying, hey, is that a turbine car? <laughs> that they'd park it in their garage and close the door and hide it because they were scared of people bus loads of kids, and they'd stop because the bus driver wanted to see it, and all the kids get out. Next thing you know, there's 75 kids standing around the car. <clears throat> but the cars caused an absolute sensation, and they got all this press out of it. Chrysler, at this point, was thinking, do we put these cars into production or not? Now, this is a schematic of the Ghia turbine car, and it's interesting for a couple reasons, not the least of which you'll notice that the exhaust system is extremely wide because it's moving so much air. But again, it's cooling the air, so by the time it gets to the tailpipe, it's not hot. It's not that hot. Um, but again, everything about this car was custom special built for this program. So prior to this, the turbine cars were just simply dropping an engine into another Chrysler product. Here, we're dropping the, the, the engines into a specific car built specifically for this engine. Interestingly, um, I've interviewed people who were in Italy watching these cars get made by Ghia. Ghia didn't use an assembly line in the traditional sense. They had guys who handmade these cars. And they handmade them to such an extent that they were beautiful, but the parts from one car wouldn't fit another car. So for instance, the first user car that got lent to a family was lent to a guy named Richard Vlaha in Chicago. He was stopped at a light and he got rear-ended. And he called up Chrysler all embarrassed and said, I got rear-ended, there's nothing I can do about it, but I got rear-ended, what do I do? So Bill Carey, I think, said, take it to a local body shop. He knew the body shop in Chrysler that Chrysler used for things. Take it there and have them call me. And the guy called him and said, this trunk is lost. It's lost. We cannot fix this trunk. Just send me a new trunk lid, a new deck lid. And so they sent him a deck lid, and the guy called him and said, it doesn't fit. It's off by several inches. And so 
Bill Carey said, I'm really sorry, I'm short of sending you a whole new car. You've got to do what you can to salvage that deck lid. So they took the deck lid out of, you know, and, 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 and hammered it back out and got it to fit. But the cars were these works of art that, you know, were built specifically for this program. Here's Bill Carey on the left, pointing at the engine. Um, one of the things that Chrysler discovered is that as they lent these cars out, they got a lot of publicity from the cars driving around. But they could also make the people who were getting the cars famous locally. So you can find articles in the paper where it'll say, like, Royal Oak Banker gets turbine car. And there'll be an article in the free press, the news, the Royal Oak Tribune, and there's a picture of some banker and his wife standing next to the turbine car with, you know, George Huebner or Bill Carey or somebody standing there presenting them the keys to the turbine car. And then you get this huge, you know, free publicity out of it. And then like I said, Bill Carey would, at the end of the user term, go pick the car up, bring it back, clean it, detail it, do whatever maintenance was necessary, and then deliver it to the next user in the program. The sad part is that as it got to the end of this program, of the 55 cars, 46 of them were destroyed. There is a huge controversy about this, which I have resolved. And the controversy is this. When you import cars from another country into the United States, you have a choice. You can pay the full import duty on the value of the car, or you can pay a lesser fee if you promise that you're not going to keep the car in America for very long. So the reason they have such a law, for instance, imagine that you're a Formula One driver. You come to America, they bring a Formula One car if they were to have a Formula One race here. You don't pay a full import duty on a race car to bring it here, race it, and then bring it back to Italy. So Chrysler was looking at this going, do we pay the full import duty on all 55 cars? And they said, we probably aren't going to want them, all 55 of them. So they paid the full import duty on a couple of them, but not all of them. So at the end of the program, they rounded the cars up, and they actually put a call out to museums and said, any museum in America that wants one of these cars, basically, call us and we'll let you have it. The Smithsonian got one. The Peterson Museum in LA's got one. The Detroit Historical Society in Detroit's got one, although theirs is currently on loan to the Gilmore Museum in uh, Hickory Corners near Kalamazoo. The St. Louis Museum of Transportation's got one. And um, there's a couple others floating around here, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, they gave one to Harrah's, and Harrah's sold theirs. And at one point, it was owned by um, uh, uh, Tom Monahan of, of Domino's fame. And then when he sold his car, he sold it to a private collector named Kletz out of Indiana, whose son, David Kletz, now has the car. And that car now runs. And that's the interesting thing, is that when they donated the cars to the museums, they were concerned about the image of the car because replacement parts wouldn't be available for it. So if you give this car to a museum and it runs, and something breaks down on it, now they've got a broken down turbine car. So Chrysler said, at, right at the outset, the car won't run, it's for static display. So they ship you the car, the engine is there, but they've removed the, the, the fans from inside the turbine engine. But what they also did is they realized they did have extra engines laying around, and Chrysler didn't know what to do with those, so they actually said to the museums, if you want a display engine, we'll send you a display engine. Some of the display engines were complete. So the people at the St. Louis Museum said, wait, we have an engine, we got a car. <laughs> and they've got to run a turbine car now. And Frank Kletz, had one that wasn't running, and the engine that was donated to Harris got separated from it. And Frank Kletz, a well-known car collector, knows Jay Leno, and he called up Jay Leno and was talking about the turbine car, and he goes, I wish it would run. Well, Jay Leno's good friends with Bob Lutz, who at the time had connections to Chrysler, so I think he worked there. And Bob Lutz said, you know, I think we've got a few of those laying around. And next thing you know, Kletz has got a, a turbine engine courtesy of Bob Lutz and Jay Leno, and Bill Carey helped him put it in, and now he's got a running turbine car also. So there are some cars out there. Nine of them survived of the 55 that were built. 46 were destroyed. No, 55, 46, and nine. There we go. So um, nine of them survived. Chrysler kept three of them, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And I, the photograph I showed you earlier of the one on the pedestal, obviously, is at the uh, museum in Auburn Hills. So, Chrysler now is at a crossroads. Do they put this thing into production, or do they simply continue experimenting with it? At one point in time, Chrysler actually decided they were going to make a short run of cars. And there's a debate about possibly putting them into the 1966 Charger. If you remember the 66 Charger, this is not that car. 66 Charger was the fastback, 
And there's a discussion about possibly building 500 of those cars, putting turbine engines into them, and selling them to the public. But the problem with that is, is that even putting 500 of them into the public, you still have to have a supply chain of replacement parts, you have to train all the mechanics, you've got to have, you know, if the guy buys the turbine car at the dealership, he's got to be able to bring it back in for service, and so on. And, and so they're crunching numbers on this, and Chrysler's finances were not real good uh, at this point in time. And they were discussing also the possibility of building the turbine engines in a plant dedicated to that. So far, these engines had all been built in small runs. A lot of the metal work was being done by local casting places. They've been contracted out. They said, okay, what would it cost to build a plant from the ground up to do nothing but build turbine engines? And in the mid-1960s, somebody floated the number of $1 billion with a B. And Chrysler didn't have that kind of money. So they said, you know something? We're not going to do it at this moment in time. We'll see how things change. But they continued doing development work on the turbine engine specifically trying to do things like make it more efficient, give it better throttle response, and so on. And so they were ironing out these details. So this is the vehicle that came out next. This is the fifth generation turbine engine in this car. And again, they drive around, they do testing with it, they got publicity with it, but they realized that now it's getting kind of old. And they said, hey, we've got a new, a new turbine car to show you. The next question always is, well, will you lend it to people or not? And they said, well, you know, we don't have a fleet of them yet. So, as they were developing these cars along the way, again, another turbine car that's got a turbine engine in it. Um, and again, it's not custom built, but just simply another Chrysler product they shoehorned a turbine engine into. It was around this time, and I'm talking about the early 70s, when people started thinking about gasoline. And, they, and I'm talking about thinking about it in a bad way, because it's costing too much money. And when people suddenly realized, wait a second, we've got a product here that will run on things other than gasoline. And so they would start doing these demonstrations where they literally have the engine connected to this device and they could flip a switch and change what fuel it's running on without doing anything else to the car. You know, obviously you can change how your car is configured to run on different kinds of fuels, but it involves changing spark plugs or changing timing or changing ignition, changing something. You just flip a switch and the car would run on it. They did demonstrations running turbine cars on tequila, <laughs> on perfume, well, there's a debate about that. And they did demonstrations running them on vegetable oil and peanut oil. And I've spoken to guys who were there and they ran on peanut oil, and they said it had a nice smelling exhaust because it's like you're cooking chocolate chip cookies. And the tequila one came about because they took one of the turbine cars on a world tour. You can find footage on the internet of a turbine car in Australia or driving by the Eiffel Tower or driving by Big Ben. And they took the turbine car around the world to show Chrysler's prowess at this. And when they were in Mexico, one of the engineers jokingly said, this thing will run on anything that burns. And their host said, would it run on tequila? And the guy said, yeah, sure it will. And he ran and found a phone as quickly as he could and called back to Highland Park and said, will it run on tequila? And they're like, haven't tried it yet. So somebody ran up you know, and found a gallon of cheap tequila ran back and dumped it in the car, fired it up, and it ran. And they called him back and said, yeah, go ahead and do it. And so they did the demonstration, <laughs> running it on tequila. So it'll run on anything. You know, VO5 hairspray or Chanel No. 5 perfume. I think Chanel No. 5 would be the most valuable fuel you could put into it. But the fact is, it would run, you know. And so they do this demonstration. But again, at this point in time, people are saying, yeah, you know, I mean, how much money can we invest in this program just to get something that runs on different fuels? And as we know, people's attention spans on fuel prices, I and mean, we've already forgotten about it because it's a buck fifty gallon right now, right? So, this is a later photograph, and, the, and, and the, uh, on the left, of course, is the bronze turbine car, and on the right is the last turbine car. And the last turbine car was built partially with funding from the EPA. When Chrysler was running out of money at one point in time, somebody in Chrysler said, you know, we're not gonna continue funding this program of yours. It's costing too much money, we're not seeing any results. And somebody said, I wonder if the Department of Energy would underwrite us to some extent because we're coming up with an alternate fuel car. <laughs> and so the Department of Energy actually did, in fact, give them some money and, and, and say, go ahead and develop this car. And this is one of the vehicles on the right that I'd love to know the whereabouts of today. I've heard debates about who owned the car because some government money went into it, some Chrysler money went into it. And, and we don't know where it went. I, I've actually exchanged emails with the guy who designed the body of the car. Um, it's a beautiful car. 
And um, you know, it's, it's a modified, it looks kind of like another car, but it's actually modified heavily for the turbine car usage. But again, this is towards the end of the program. And they, the first car that got a turbine engine dropped into it, like I said, was 1953. The last car was 1978, but they actually ran the program until 1983. So it was more than 25 years of development of this along the way. Um, we're missing two slides. OK, I'll describe them to you. Um, the next slide as I, I had was a picture of the cover of Mopar Action Magazine with Jay Leno standing next to a turbine car. And I mentioned to you that there were nine survivors of the program, uh, of, the, of the original turbine cars. And Jay Leno had seen the turbine car at the World's Fair in New York in 1964. And like I said before, they lent a bunch of the cars to the public, but they also took one around the world. Well, they took two to the World's Fair. And they actually had, if you've seen the World's Fair display of Chrysler in 1964, it's huge. One of the things they had was a track that ran around their display and they had turbine cars doing loops all day long, and you would go to a local dealer and get a ticket, and go then get in line like a ride at the you know Disneyland and get a ride in a turbine car. And I've actually spoken to guys whose job it was to do nothing all day long but simply do circles at New you know the World's Fair in a turbine car with three passengers. They go do a loop, all three out, three more in, do a loop, three out. And they had two turbine cars at the fair because they're always concerned what happens when one breaks down. You can't say oh the the ride is closed today, the car broke down. Horrible publicity. Now, they never did break down, but they had two cars there. So Jay Leno went to the World's Fair, and I think he told me he was 14 years old at the time, and you might not know this, but the Ford Mustang was also introduced at the same World's Fair. So the big debate, if you're a car guy, is which was cooler, the Ford Mustang or the Chrysler Turbine car? And Jay told me that he actually didn't get a ride in it at that time because he was, he was he didn't have the patience to stand in line for the length of time it would have taken to, to get up there. But he always thought to himself, someday when I own a lot of cars, I'd love to own a turbine car. And Chrysler, like I mentioned, had three turbine cars that they retained. And somewhere along the line, uh, Jay was talking to somebody at Chrysler and managed to sweet talk them into selling him one of the turbine cars. So Jay got one of the turbine cars from Chrysler and he got one of the running turbine cars. So those of you who are familiar with this, uh, it was the Proving Ground car. So there, were, there was, I think, one car at the museum, one at the archive, and one at the Proving Grounds, and that was the Proving Grounds car that Jay's got. But the three cars are identical. It's hard to tell them apart other than the VIN number. Um, but so anyways, Jay buys this car. And I had written a manuscript about the turbine car program. I was fascinated by this, and I couldn't get the book published. Because every publisher I pitched it to said, nobody, nobody reads car books. Car guys don't read. And mm -hmm. So <laughs> I, I said, well, you know, I've got this book. So it's kind of a funny story, which I'll, I'll abbreviate for you. I wrote a book called Death's Door about the Italian Hall disaster, where 73 people died in a stampede during a children's Christmas party in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan after a false cry of fire. The book's called Death's Door. It's got a very dark, somber cover. And a local newspaper up there ran an ad that said, makes a great Christmas gift. Death's door. <laughs> and somebody sent that newspaper clipping into Jay Leno, and he ran it on his funny headlines segment that he did every week. I was driving into work the next day, and my friends were all calling me, and Steve, you were on the Tonight Show last night. And I didn't know what they are talking about. So I finally figured it out. So I thought, well, it's funny that he said that. So I took a copy of Death's Door, wrapped it in Christmas paper, put a big bow on it, and I sent it to Jay with a note that said, Merry Christmas. And then I included a copy of the Turbine Car Manuscript and said, by the way, I suspect that, you know, I know you're a car guy, you might not care about the local history so much, but you might enjoy the Turbine Car book. And about a week later, my secretary buzzes me, she goes, Steve, a guy who says he's Jay Leno is on the phone. <laughs> and I've got a friend who routinely calls me and changes his name each time he calls me. He's dead. He claims to be, you know, Abraham Lincoln or whatever. But so I get on the phone because I know it's him. And he goes, hey, Steve, I, I just read this. This is great. You should get this published. And I said, but that's the problem. I can't get it published. He said, well, is it OK if I keep your number? And I said, sure. You know, if you ever get arrested in Detroit, I guess give me a call. <laughs> so it was a year or two later that he called me and said, Steve, I just bought a turbine car. And he goes, I need to speak to Bill Carey. And I talk about Bill Carey in the book as the guy who went around the country and repaired these cars. And he goes, I, I bought the car, and I want Bill Carey to come out here and, and tune it up for me. 
So I put Bill Perry in touch with Jay Leno, and then Jay called me back to thank me and said, if you're ever in California, I'll let you drive it. So I was in California shortly thereafter, got to drive his car, and then while I was at his garage, which by the way is a misnomer, it's, it's a series of buildings that contain over 100 cars and over 100 motorcycles, and they all run. Um, he, he said, by the way, if it would help you get the book published, I'll write the foreword for you. So if you see the book, it says, book by Steve Lato, foreword by Jay Leno. And that's how that came about. So Jay's got a turbine car. He let me drive it. And it's the only turbine car I've gotten to drive. I've seen most of them. I haven't seen all of them. I've seen most of the ones that still survive. But I got to drive Jay's. And the neat thing about a turbine car, if you haven't seen one or driven one, is they look like and ride like and everything about them just seems like a typical mid-1960s Chrysler but they sound like a low-flying jet. And it's, it's a cross between, I don't describe it, it's like a big vacuum cleaner. And we're driving through Burbank, California on a Saturday afternoon, and as we're going down the street, people's heads are turning, and it, 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 it does, it causes a commotion, because people don't know what to equate that sound with. And then of course they see, oh, it's a funky car, oh, this is Jay Leno, you know. So, I got to drive his car, and that was, that was a blast, and that, but the cool thing is that got the book published. And what's interesting is the book has now gone, it's hardcover, it's also in paperback, and the book is outselling all expectations of my publisher, who now realize that car guys do read. <laughs> so, the same publisher is putting out a book I'm writing, which, which would be up to fall about Preston and Tucker. And I guarantee you they would not have published that book if, if, if we hadn't had the success with this book that we've had. And this book has done very, very well. And it's interesting because I get phone calls and emails from all around the country from people who say, I remember seeing one of those cars. And people remember the bronze turbine car. I, I remember seeing one as a little kid. I must have been seven or eight years old I saw one. Um, I think I know who's driving now that I know the whole story. But it's, it's, it's amazing. But I've met people all around the country who say, you know, I saw one. And we can actually figure out which car it is. Because they'll say it's in Oklahoma in 1966. And we actually have a list of all the names and locations of all the people who had them and the dates. And we can figure this stuff out. It's amazing how that works out. So that's the story of Chrysler's turbine car. Um, questions, I'm happy to take them. And then afterwards, I'll be out there signing books and, and hopefully. Uh... So any questions? What's the title of your book? The book is called Chrysler's Turbine Car. Um, but the subtitle is The Rise and Fall of Detroit's Coolest Creation. And the only person who's objected to that title was a Ford guy. Who, who sent me an email to yell at me about that. And I said, well, I understand we'll have to agree to disagree on that. You've got a new book coming out on the Daytona and Superbird. How can we get a copy of that? Um, yeah, that's, that's the other thing is I don't have it with me, but I just finished the book and it will be out in about a week about the wind car program at Chrysler. So Dodge Daytona and the Plymouth Superbird. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with those cars also. It's like a coffee table book. Um, if you go to Amazon and type in my last name, you'll find all those books listed. And that book should be available for purchase within a day or two, like for shipping, any day now. Any other questions? Yes. Oh wait, wait, hold on, hold on. Yes. One of the uh, one of the cars we're seeing more and more of these hybrids that have a gasoline engine and an electric powertrain, whatever. Yes. Would a turbine be ideal, Eric, because it doesn't have to handle a transient? It could be small, light, cheap, blah blah blah. That is actually a very good question because the best purpose, the best use you could put one of these today would be to do it as a turbine electric hybrid. Because the problem with the turbines is to spool them up to speed is where all the energy is burned. But if you run them at a steady state, they're very efficient. That's why you get up to altitude and you, just, you cruise, they burn so much fuel simply getting to altitude. So if somebody were to build a small turbine engine and a generator and then put it in an electric car, that would solve many problems. Williams International experimented with that briefly with the GM EV1 program. And they actually built a working model of it, but they actually didn't put it into production because the EV1 got killed. But that's, that's something that people have looked at and actually be a great way to, to use those. 
I was uh, right after the Daimler takeover, I was at the Truman Ground driving some export minivans. And uh, we ended up in the garage, and they were, there was a turbine car in the garage. And I walked over looking at the car, and there's a mechanic working on it. And I asked, what's, what's the story with this car? He says he's getting it running and getting it prepared to go to Stuttgart. He said, sure, I'm going to send it, the car to Stuttgart. Do you know if we ever got that car back? <laughs> I hope so. I think it was that never came back. Yeah, because I know, I know that the Proving Ground car that Jay Leno bought ran when he bought it. And he bought it, I don't know, 07 or 08. And then there was two cars that Chrysler had in their possession, and Bill Curry got both of them running. So it must have been one of those two. But I don't, I don't, I haven't been following them that closely recently, so I don't know. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. How you get a turbine car with a gallon of tequila? You know, <laughs> that's, you know, that's a good question. One of the things that Chrysler did not publicize about the car is what kind of fuel economy you got, gasoline, tequila, or otherwise. And it's probably because it wasn't that good. But then again, I talked to Jay, and he says he doesn't think it's that bad either. You know, if you go back and look at a Hemi Roadrunner, with automatic transmission, which you could get, by the way, and you know, put it in the hand of a teenage driver. I mean, single digits for you know, gallon. I mean, seriously. Yeah. So <laughs> it depends on driving habits and so on. And, and but, so the, the, the fuel economy wasn't that great. But on the other hand, knowing you could run diesel, kerosene, home heating oil, that would certainly made things more interesting, if nothing else. Yes. I was just wondering, uh, what happened to the cars that didn't survive? Were they crushed? Were they? Yeah, you know, they took the engines out of them because the engines weren't important. <clears throat> they pulled the engines and drivetrains out of them, and they took them to a wrecking yard in Romulus. And I've spoken to people who were there, and they actually trashed them. I mean, they literally ran them with forklifts and took them over to a crusher, crushed them, and burned them. And that's one thing about the federal government. If you tell them you're going to destroy a car, they need proof. So they filmed it. So you can see film of these cars being destroyed, and it's, it's, it's sad. I mean, there are handmade works of art by Italian craftsmen that get imported over here at some exorbitant cost, and then they're being destroyed at a scrapyard run. And um, one of the guys I interviewed said, um, you've never seen that many grown men cry in one place. And it's just sad seeing that happen, you know? Yes? Did the car run on the mixture of fuels? Yeah, the, the car would run any any liquid that burned. So you could run anything through it, and you could actually probably have mixed fuels too, as long as the fuels didn't react badly with each other. But you know, they they, they ran them on everything. I mean, I've, I've heard stories, like I said, of, of, of hairspray, and and of course the tequila. So any any liquid that would burn would run. Oddly enough, the one thing you couldn't run in it was pump gas. Because at the time, pump gas was leaded, and the lead would damage the internals of the engine. So that's the one thing that says you cannot run it on pump gas. There were people at the time who had a hard time finding non-leaded gas, because back then that's all people sold. But if you went to a truck stop on the freeway, you can always get diesel. And so I, I interviewed a couple of guys who said they said to remember to always make the trip out to the truck stop to get diesel for the car before they ran out of gas. Yes? How about emissions? The that was another problem. One of the problems that they had with this car was the emissions. And, and you'll recall that the EPA started clamping down on smog, late 60s, early 70s. And every company had its own way of dealing with would it be catalytic converters or these air pumps or different things. And there are different things they were measuring. They measure CO2 emissions, but NOx. And the problem is that depending on what fuel you were running, the NOx emissions of the turbine engine were very, very bad. The problem is they hadn't been planning them yet. In other words, when they were building the turbine car in the 50s and 60s, their only concern was, can we make it run? And then all of a sudden, the EPA goes, well, it's also got to have a clean tailpipe. And that's one of the things that would have really caused problems. And they were experimenting with ways to get around that, because there's things you can do with the combustion temperature or the fuel you're burning and so on. But that would have been another hurdle they'd have to overcome to make the car marketable. Yes? Are you aware that the one, there's one of these 
cars hanging out in the uh, Chrysler Museum at Auburn Hill. Yes, that's it's hanging from the from the ceiling. You yeah, touch it. yeah. One of the shots I had here was was that car, but from above. And it, I think it's called the tower. Yeah, and so I've, I've seen it up there, and I've also seen it when it wasn't up there. But yeah, you're right. So if you want to see one, that's the closest place to see one. But there are, they are they're around different museums that's got them. Yes? Does the Henry Ford Museum have one? Yes, the Henry Ford's got one also. The Henry Ford also has a tucker. So <laughs> you can see all kinds of neat cars out there. Yes? No information about the each cost of this engine versus the console. That's another thing they never said, so we don't know that. That's critical. Oh, of course it is. And that's one of the reasons they were doing things like building the, the single casting fan blades. One of the guys I interviewed with the book, and he passed away about a year or two ago, is Dr. Roy, Amity Roy, who lived here in Troy. He was a metallurgist, and he spent many years doing nothing but experimenting on how to bring the cost down because these parts, many of them had to be made out of very, very exotic metals so they could withstand the high temperatures inside the engine. And so they were bringing the cost down, but you're right, to make this program work, they would have to be able to mass produce these things on the same scale as mass producing the various things that they do right now for various cars. So that would have been another problem. The cost, the emissions, and just the financial trouble the Chrysler was having at the time. What was the RPM of the turbine? The turbine engine idled at about 20,000 RPM, and it redlined at about 60,000 RPM. So when you were looking at the gauges on the dashboard, that was different and so was the temperature. Because the temperature gauge in most cars measures the, you know, the, the coolant temperature, which is like 150 degrees or something. And the internal temperature in this was in the thousands of degrees. So when you sit in a turbine car and look at the gauges until you don't look at the, you know, not looking at the numbers, it looks like a typical Chrysler instrument cluster. But then you see the RPM thing go up to you know, 70,000 RPM. Yes? Don't we today have the cousins of the turbine engine with our tur turbocharged engine? I have a course of the turbocharged in South and S. Yeah, the turbochargers, yeah, the turbochargers use a lot of the same technology with the fact that they have impellers spinning at very high rates of speed and so on. And it's, it's, all, it's all a thing of you know, how much air can you move through the engine and how efficiently can you burn it and use that energy that you create. For those of you who are curious, the Chrysler turbine car had an automatic transmission. It had a torque flight in it. The question is how do you mate an engine turning at 40,000 RPM to an automatic torque flight? And the way you do it is you have the output of the turbine engine be a fan blade that blows over another fan blade that's connected to the input shaft of the transmission. And so there's no solid connection between the transmission and the engine. And so there was no torque converter in the car. What this meant also was that you could get this car fired up once the engine was warmed up, stand on the brakes, and then floor it. And then you pop the brake, and it would take off like a animal. And they didn't want people to know that, because of course it'd be very, very hard on the brakes and the engines. But on the few occasions where they were challenged about how slow, how slow these cars were, the guys would do that demonstration, and they How'd you do that? Uh, yeah. I'm an engineer. <laughs> yes? So, um, about, in about 1970, their Andy Van Selle, I remember, was doing Indy race cars. Yes. Service. Yes. I never understood. Was there any connection between the two programs? No, there wasn't, but it was all part of the same fascination people have with turbine engines. Turbine engines, keeping in mind that they're most efficient, running at a constant state or as close as you can to getting it there, would be great at the Indy 500 because you're spending all your time floored and turning left. And so what the, the some of those cars, by the way, are four-wheel drive. They put out so much power, they could actually power all four wheels and still be competitive. And when Andy Granatelli did very, very well one year with a jet engine, Indy didn't like the way that was going. And the family that runs Indy really likes to keep their, keep out, you know, how they run it. And so they outlawed basically what the intake size was of the engine. And they outlawed it down to the size of, of a carburetor. And basically you could run a carbureted engine but not a turbine engine. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, well I've got books, they're discounted today because you, you're such nice people. I've got hardcover paperbacks, I take credit cards, checks, anything you don't buy I gotta carry back to my car.
So, thank you. Awesome. The hard cover is normally 25, today it's 20. Paperback is normally 18, today it's 15. Right out here.